Industrial steam traction lingered on after British Railways phased it out. This film was made from 1969 onwards and consists of a study of steam at work in the home counties and Wales. This fireless loco is very rare indeed. They were used in places where there was a fire risk, such as running in and out of this paper mill on the Kent coast near Gravesend, and where there was a supply of steam already available in the works plant. It runs for about 45 minutes on one full charge. It looks as if it's had some careless drivers recently. Note the cylinders under the cab and the chimney at the back of the cab roof. We understand that this one has been bought and saved for posterity. A visit was made by an enthusiasts club to a large industrial concern at Swanscombe, Kent. Dedicated grises work in all weather conditions where there's a wisp of steam about. This railway had quite a mileage connecting with BR and carrying thousands of tons of minerals involved in the manufacturing of cement. Six months later, on another visit, a very different site. Just this one is left working, and then it only goes up and down a few sidings nearby.
With a view of the nearby River Thames, we see the last loco left from a once large fleet sadly trundling up and down, its days surely numbered. There are three pits in Kent, and they are all in danger of being closed down. Back in 1970, when this film was made, a visit was made to see them all. At Snowdon, two or three locos have plenty of work to do. In weather conditions described as murky, they were run out for us to see and even get a ride on. Note the overhead traction wires. Perhaps they were for class 71 to come in and do some shunting. This pit has just the one tank here, and after its lunch break we went over to see it. Before we managed to get a ride on it, the driver had to ask his boss for permission on his two-way radio mounted in the cab. That was granted, so off we went for a tour of the run to the tip, some distance away.
This 08 would require some assistance if it's to get its load back up the incline. Radstock was once a busy railway interchange in the middle of the Somerset coalfield. This station has long lost its passengers. Most of the traffic has been curtailed and the whole place due to close down when the local colliery finishes. The Somerset and Dorset Railway Preservation Group used this shed to house their locomotive while it was under repair. They did hope to set up a railway centre here, but moved out several years later. The line was used to collect coal from this colliery, the last one left in the county. It had, at the time this film was made, just this little 040. And its driver spoke to us. Just had the ten year test. The, the boiler's eleven years old now. The hydraulic test and all that. Well, he, he's perfect, the boiler. I'd like an idiot. But when the coal was finished with it, I wouldn't mind it. The president of our club, he wanted to buy it to keep it in Redstar. Whether the coal board is sold to someone else, I can't say. But he offered goes as much as 800, and whether they'll let it go for scrap price, I don't know. I expect he'll be working till the big close, perhaps another two or three years. It is pretty shaky at the moment, you see. We'll see whether they have uh, prospects ready more, I don't know. But there's nothing wrong with this engine at all. I wonder what happened to it. The main duty was to propel loaded trucks across the fields at the top of a rope-worked incline, one of the last two left working in England at that time. The trucks are attached to the rope here and slowly let down. This is a one-in-four slope. The heavy one going down lifts an empty one up at the same time. The driver told us about it. There's nothing happened to uh, any change here, apart from the incline, the brakes on the incline, and where under private enterprise they had a double line from top to bottom. When the cohort took over, they had a double line in the top half and went off into one to save expense for uh, maintenance. We've had more trouble, you see, with the uh, trucks coming up on the same road as the load. We had that happen once. There's the empty coming up into what we call the loaded road, the one where the load was going down. And my mate just put his brakes down and stood out the way and they just come together like that.
bottom awaiting BR train. For years, nobody knew that within two miles of the city of London were two steam engines still at work long after steam had been banished from British railways. Where are you going? I'm a the power station at Wilsdon Junction had its own tracks which connected to the main Euston line nearby. Coal trains were shunted into connecting sidings and steam locos collected them. A visit was laid on for us. Permission had been difficult to obtain, but it was worth all the trouble when it arrived. The loco men were very keen and helpful in making our visit an enjoyable one. I wonder if this is the only time it's ever cleaned. It was decided to go down to the shed and haul out the spare loco for our cameras. One of these two went to the Southall Railway Centre, West London, for a while, although we understand that place is under threat. Considerable difficulty was had in getting permission to see this one. It's at the Cardington Power Station at Bedford. We understand they have a spare, but it was in bits at the time. A diesel loco took over the work a year or two later, and that was the end of steam here. A snatched shot of this one sent us down to Dagenham to see what was on hand. 
But too late, they decided to stop steam traction two weeks before, and the loco sat in a siding looking rather sad. It had been looked after so well, and the lining on the side was as good as we'd seen on bigger locos. Nearby, some evidence of the rundown of Ford's railway system could be seen, stock being cut up and some being rebuilt. At least this was in steam and working too. A visit to Neesden, the main London transport depot in 1969, found plenty of red tube trains about. Lurking at the back could be found three ex-Great Western pannier tanks. These are the last of 11 that LT had bought. The power station behind this one has long since gone. For some reason, today the steam crane was being prepared for use. It was shunted about and then went right out of the yard. The reason was soon quite clear. That day, very early in the morning, a tube train had crashed into a battery loco standing in the station, killing the driver. The steam crane was going to pull the wrecked trains apart when it finally trundled up. It's very rare to see a steam crane in action anywhere these days, and to see one assisting in a train disaster was even more interesting.
Nearby, some old metropolitan railway coaches lie rotting in the sun. Then one day in 1971, London Transport decided to have a farewell to steam day when they withdraw the last three panniers. This is L94 going off to the big city to take part in a final show on its last day working for London Transport. That day our film unit had four cameramen all over the route to get some comprehensive pictures of the occasion. L94 trundled right through all the metropolitan tunnels up to Moorgate, where it was going to join its train. Gladstone is reputedly to be amongst people in the contractor's coach on the opening day in 1863. Broad gauge locos were used too, but the Great Western pulled out soon after the standard gauge engines arrived on loan from the Great Northern. Today, TV crews and notable railway enthusiasts were on hand to witness the final run of a London transport steam train. No more will London's skyscrapers see wisps of steam about them. L94 slowly creeps forward to greet its fans and stops for the many hundreds of cameras and recorders. was hauling a special works train for track maintenance all the way to Neesden. At Farringdon it crossed over to the Metropolitan Lines for Kings Cross and Baker Street. followed up in a new tube train and it was arranged for us to pass it at Finchley Road. Enthusiasts were at every station to see it hurtling by them. an immense crowd awaited it. London Transport certainly underestimated the interest it would receive. 
We understand that the recently preserved med tank, now at Quaint and Road Society, is being invited to run again on London Transport's tracks from Baker Street. And so here's L94 as triumphant arrival at Neesden Yard. The crowds were immense by now, and it was soon surrounded by people hoping to talk to the driver and take his autograph. He was presented with a medal from the Seven Valley Railway Society for being the last driver of a steam engine on London Transport's metals. We think they had designs on L94, hoping to get it to Bridge North. Five Locomotive Preservation Society. I'm going to present you with this model of the locomotive which you have been driving today. Oh, thank you very much. And this is a plaque which will be coming to you for the locomotive, which says that we presented this to you and also recognise you as driving the last steam oh, locomotive yeah. of London Town. Yeah. Meanwhile, at the other end of the yard was L90, which was shunted up and down for the entertainment of the crowd, which by now was enormous. Indeed, our cameraman had to crawl on the ground to get these shots. There were other things to see today. A battery loco, a Metline electric loco, and a de icer train made up of two old 1925 tube cars from the central line. Now we move to South Wales in 1970. A study is to be made of several areas. Industrial relics are found everywhere. Let's hope they've been restored to a viewable condition for future generations to examine and learn about early steam engineering. The first colliery scene is at Hafod Irenes near Pontypool. Due for closure very soon, they said. Its locos were in a very poor state. Steam leaked from everywhere, and in a very uncared for condition, they could only just struggle up the heavy gradients with a handful of trucks. The line on the left belongs to BR and was due to close down too. At Blenarven nearby, surrounded by a huge industrial landscape, one little engine, Toto, is just about to run along to its shed. It seems to spew hot cinders everywhere it goes.
Over the unsteady track it lurches on its way. The spare loco is here and will be used tomorrow. Each loco has one day on and one day off. Mountain Ash, a large mining community surrounding the shed. There were many pits here once. Trains from Cardiff used to stop here and the passengers once had a good view of the shed filled with tank engines. They had at least six here on our visit in 1970. Three were out working and two were being serviced, ready for their next shift. There was talk of this one going to a preserved steam railway somewhere. At Abba Van, there were glimpses from outside the shed as no permission was granted to view closer. They were a little touchy due to the infamous landslide a few years ago which slid down to the village and buried the school. However, we did catch this one going out on a trip working. Moving further into Wales, we come to Ponta do Lais near Llanethli. Here was a large interchange yard with BR. Coal trains would arrive and after much shunting be taken onto the main line by diesel. These ugly huge tanks would do all the work and then prepare the trains of empties ready for the trip back to the colliery. But first, a level crossing. After crossing the main A48 Swansea Road, a hefty climb is undertaken. Miners used to have their own little stations here. Old coaches used to be on the train especially for them. Today they all have cars.
All this has long since gone. Never again the blasting steam exhaust will echo through the hills. Going north into the heart of the valley, we find Maisteg, a vast mining area involving pits and associated washing plant scattered all over the place. Our film unit spent days soaking up the atmosphere. All day and most of the night, steam locos could be heard working somewhere in the darkness. There were tracks stretching for miles in all directions. Because of the sighting of the collieries and assembly yards, locos worked very hard indeed. There were signs, though, of the general decline of the coal industry, even in 1970. Steam traction on the way out, as the last few trucks eased their way across the bottom of the valley. It was very sad to witness. In 1969, steam traction had been resurrected to help build a motorway. This is the loco shed at York Road Station in Belfast. There were six of these 264 tanks, strongly resembling Stanier's design for the LMS in England. Built for the Northern Counties Committee, the body responsible for running Ulster's remaining railways, they were of the Irish standard gauge of 5 foot 3 inches. Diesel traction began to take over from steam in 1965 and just a few of these locos were kept in store.
When a large quarry on the line to Larne was opened to supply material for the motorway foundations, they were put to good use. The trains are extremely heavy. A loco is required at each end of the long train. One of the drivers told us about them. You think look at that scrap? When they, uh, what are they going to do with these locos then? What's that? They're going to scrap them soon? Oh, they're scrap, I suppose. They're just, uh, they're not maintaining them, they're just running them into the ground. It appears that they are being run into the ground. One of the locos was saved from scrapping later by the local preservation society and today is used on specials all over the country.
sometimes steam deputised for a failed diesel. After this film was made, they had all gone, and motorists in Belfast.